Poor Bev's looking at us like what she got herself into. <laughs> um, Trust me, this let, is. Let me tell you, years ago we did Peter when Peter was still alive. We did a talk on the sports. What was it? S E. What's oh S E N. S E. Yep. And they hadn't given us. They wanted the pair of us there. <laughs> <laughs> and they started off, and it was fine. And then they got into um, asking Peter about tantric sex, <laughs> and <laughs> and he's just. Because he's very, he's a very private person, believe it or not. And anything issue of personal stuff, he just... And he's looked at me, he's gone bright red. <laughs> I'm thinking, I've got to rescue this poor bugger here. Oh. Just, <laughs> so the whole tone of the, the uh, interview session became quite hilarious. Oh, I just, God. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, tantric sex. Um, let's... <laughs> you know, we're more like... Um, we're more like Ando's brush with fame. Um, so <laughs> little Pavle over here is going to play the part of Ando. And by the end of this, he'll actually sketch you a picture, which is more like a stick figure. I don't know why he puts a willy on it every time. So weird. So immature. Um, I would, we, we probably should start, I guess, from, from the beginning because um, I'd like to anyway, because yeah. uh, where you sort of grew up was WA. Yes. And... It was an interesting time because it was 1947. The war, I guess, had just wrapped up. Yeah. And uh, you're a small town out of Perth? There's no town. No town? No town. Oh, my goodness. Out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. There was, if we needed, if mum and dad needed, they hooked up the horse and cart and went in over the dirt road to the nearest railway siding and there was a little, um, like a corner store there. And they could, you know, we got, you'd get a, a bag, of, a, like a, what these days would be a 50 kilo bag of sugar and one of flour mm. and everything else, you were self-sufficient. So horse and cart until I was probably seven, then a Ford A, model Ford A, there were seven yep. kids. And so no seat belts, no baby seats, no nothing. No. Dirt roads. Four day, and then we got wow, uh, an FX Holden. Oh, wow. <laughs> but the four but for seven kids? <laughs> So the four day, Dad painted British racing green with uh, a fly, scre uh, fly spray. It was a, they had a cylinder and a pump thing, filled it up with paint, and he painted unbelievable the car with the fly spray. Oh my yeah. god! I mean, it was a different era. Yeah, I was going to say if you look at that today and you said to a kid that you would have a horse and a cart <laughs> and a car to share between seven, they'd be like, "Oh no, where's my iPad?" Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah exactly. well, are we going to Sovereign Hill? What's yeah, happening? Let's see it. That's wow. just crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so immediately following the war, there was no building materials around. So mm. it was an asbestos house. So the external walls were there and the inside the house, the frame was, but the only room inside the house that had a solid wall was mum and dad's bedroom. Yeah, right. Which enabled them to produce eight kids. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that's, uh, that explains <laughs> yeah. all the siblings. You, you did come from quite a big family, back, didn't you? Well, yeah. Back then, there was nothing to stop you. There was no pills. There was yeah. no TV. There was it. no, you know, it. it was just... <laughs> The way it was. Yeah. So what, what was your childhood like, schooling and stuff like that? It was quite humble, quite simple? One teacher school. They needed uh, the local district. Uh, was The school was in the church and they had to have 12 kids to keep the church the school open. So the year, I was a year younger than, because born in January, so I was 12 months younger than I should have been to start school, mm. but I was the nearest in age. So yep. They scoured the district. They asked if I could start school a year early, which I did. I loved. Mm. And that meant the school could stay open. So went to school barefooted. You know, we had the only <laughs> books we had were school readers. Yep. Okay, occasionally yep. you were allowed, if you were good, you were allowed to take a reader home. Uh, no music. Mum and dad had a wide up gramophone with two records. Golden Wedding and Mandolin Boogie. That was the only music. <laughs> They're we Paul's favourites too. <laughs> <laughs> so it was idyllic. Yep. No drugs, no alcohol, no yep. pedophiles. Yep. You know, you could just go outside and play when the sun yep. came up and come in at night when yep. you wanted to be fed. So yep. yeah. it was simple, idyllic. Um, I wouldn't have, you know, if I look back over it all now, mm. I wouldn't change a thing, no. really. Yeah, life has become complicated, hasn't it? it I mean, it's Australia is a very different place now. It's, completely yeah. and absolutely, totally different. Yeah. So, some years ago, while Peter was still alive, we w went. We we're in West Australia, and I took him and the kids up <laughs> to have a look at, at the old place and what seemed to be a humongous distance to us as kids, because we'd have to walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mum and Dad were very clever. Come Sunday morning, 
uh, us kids that were old enough would walk into Sunday school and that would take a couple of hours to yep. walk each way. Yep. So a couple of hours to walk, God. Sunday school, a couple of hours to walk home, time for mum and dad to produce another <laughs> offspring. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, it's always something about parents on a Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> My parents always said, don't open the door, we're watching the news. <laughs> I was like, why does Peter Hitchener sound like he's moving furniture? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and what sort of kid were you? Were you uh, did you sort of gravitate to, to the books or sports? Yeah. or I, Both. I was, um, I was somewhat of a difference in our family of seven kids. <laughs> and uh, I was the one born after the war. I had two born before. And then the, they came very rapidly after me. Um, but uh, I loved school. It got me away from my brothers. <laughs> Let me tell you, it, some, it was very much a gender-based communities at that time. So um, Christmas at Sunday school, the, the prize for pass the parcels was considered that a girl couldn't pass the parcel quick enough to get the prize. So it was a boy's car, a little toy car. Which I won, and my brothers didn't have. We didn't have toys. There were no, you know, yeah, no, yeah. you had nothing. So, obviously, I had to give them the, the car. The next year, they learned their lesson. They had a doll, <laughs> oh. and I won the doll. <laughs> so I got the doll home, and three days later, I, you know, I wasn't particularly enamoured by the doll because I'd never seen dolls. Mm. And I was wondering where the doll's gone, and and one of the brothers said, um, "Up the wood heap." So I went up there and they'd cut its head off with the axe. So, so. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you so learned that, your lesson, though, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, that's the <laughs> last time you ever win anything around here. I dare you. Um, so I was, even though they were, uh, you know, my one brother 13 months younger, another one 15 months younger, and so it went like that. I really never, They were, we were very different. They hated school. I loved it. I wouldn't miss school for anything. They pleaded with mum to let them be home. So... <laughs> For me, I was I loved learning, I loved um, painting, I loved I had community sport, you name it. I played it, mm -hmm. hockey, basketball, netball, you know, all of that. Athletics. I had Shirley Strickland train me for a little while in a athletics. So and you know, that, it was, sorry to interrupt. That wouldn't have been commonplace back then for for a girl, or no, it wasn't. No. Yeah. But nobody ever said to me, as I was always top of my class yeah. and that sort of stuff. Not that we thought anything of it, but nobody ever said to me that girls don't do that. Girls don't do it. Yep. It was a time when girls did commercial, um, so they became, uh, you know, secretaries, mm. uh, worked in the bank, uh, and, or teachers, mm. uh, you know, other than that. And at, at that stage, um, if you got married, you couldn't teach as a female anyhow. <laughs> Jeez. It was a different. I, I taught, started teaching in a country town in West Australia called Beverly. Um, <laughs> Fitting. Fitting. You're the mayor. You're the mayor. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Much. So the the um, quite a, a reasonable indigenous community there that mm -hmm. lived in a um, reserve. So you know, I I got to have that experience, which yep. was good. Um, I was a science teacher. Nobody ever said to me that women don't do teach science. That women that nobody ever said to me that women don't do anything. I was never discouraged, but yep. I was never encouraged. Yep. Had I not got a scholarship, I couldn't. I was the only one in our family to finish mm. school. Oh. But had I not got a scholarship, that couldn't have happened. So, yep. yeah, so a fantastic, simple, uncomplicated mm. life that just breezed through. Mm. When did you go from from there to the to the big smoke? Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I taught um, because I'd got a scholarship. And they needed teachers then. You had to agree. If you accepted the scholarship, you had to teach for three years. Yep. So in those three years, um, I taught in a number of uh, uh, country schools, country high schools. Um, I met <laughs> I met <laughs> this Robert Redford lookalike and fell madly in love <laughs> and eloped from West Australia to <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's a big move. My mum wanted me to have the, the wedding in the big cathedral mm. because I was the one, yep. the only one who'd finished school. I was the one that, you know, mum could glow about. <laughs> so um, it was. It meant mum was one of seven children and they all had seven kids and I was going to have to pay for this wedding that was going to be <laughs> a squillion rellos <laughs> that I didn't know. Yeah, an entire so population to, of the yeah, town by the sounds yeah. of it. So I said, mum and dad, in the backyard, a couple of friends, mum freaked, took to her bed, 
your ma's got the vapors, darling. So uh, I eloped and uh, ended up in Sydney. Ah. And when did you live in Sydney? Uh, well, the guy I married had come from there originally. So his family was still in Sydney. Yep. Went back there, married in a, a registry office, um, <laughs> and taught in a boys' high school in Sydney for seven years. Yeah, right. But um, my then husband's best mate was Peter's mechanic. So Peter is at the beginning of his career, had no money. Um, so when they came to race in Sydney, they came and stayed with us. So free accommodation, yep. free meals. I yep. cooked. My then husband was a mechanic. We had a service station. So he helped on the racetrack. So yep. it started by going along as, you know, the general dog's body to do all the timing, cleaning, uh, keep the girls away when the, the, it was time to focus on the races. It's all right, Bevo, it's time. Just move them out of the way, please. So, <laughs> so I knew what I was getting into when... when well, did you like cars? Um, let's put it this way. The first car I bought, <laughs> got, <laughs> was a Cortina, and it was immaculate little Cortina, but... I find out after I've bought it that it is a lemon and it's got a mind of its own and it does what it wants when it wants, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so I had a, a mishap and got it fixed and would lend that car to anybody who wanted to borrow it, so I didn't <laughs> drive it very much. Um, when I went to Sydney um, and I needed a car of my own, <laughs> I bought a little Datsun 120Y. But oh, beautiful. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> car. Yeah. Fantastic, except yeah. back then women couldn't say, sign a contract, a sale contract. Are you serious? Absolutely. So oh the, the dealer <laughs> oh said, you'll have to bring your husband in. Oh, my God. That is and crazy. sign the contract. And I said, I beg your pardon. I said, I have a regular job. I go day by day. I go everything. I get a paycheck. He can go out for the night and said he'll be home early. I might not see him for two months. Do you want him to come in and sign the contract? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, well... We reconsider. You can sign the contract. I love that. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> that's that the, is that's great. the most wild thing I've heard, yeah, though. Like, yeah. was that just a, like a New South Wales law, or was that an Australian law? Oh, who'd know? Why bother to check? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was insanity. I mean, segregation was in, you know, yeah. back, uh, why would you check on stuff? Because it yep. was such a crazy world. Yeah. Mm, it was just you, a thing, right? Just the way yep. it was. And yeah. you, you managed. Yeah. You, did, you got on with it. Yeah. So. Mm. Uh, and then the my marriage fell apart and uh, I end up in Melbourne. Mm. So it was good. And did some somewhere between there and, sorry, the marriage, so I'm trying to backtrack a little bit. Yep. Around about the age of 22, you had a big accident with your neck, right? Yep. yep. Um, that, was, that was quite severe. Absolutely. I was teaching in this country town, not Beverly, another country <laughs> town, north of Perth. And um, they, by this stage, the government had built two... Um, houses, uh, well, they were duplexes, close. So the guys had one, single guys one side and the single girls the other. So I had, I was, I'd moved out of this derelict home that we'd been before into this nice new place with two girls. And we were 180 mile from Perth. So the, the <laughs> there was a tendency to, to develop relationships within the township. Mm. Not So one of the girls had uh, accepted a date with a farmer back then no mobile phones so he came from a farm a long way out <laughs> to it was a, for a Sunday to go water skiing with him and his mates yeah and then she finds out her boyfriend's coming up from the city <laughs> help <laughs> I girl. need I need rescue uh, will you go in my place I, yeah <laughs> fine so I was going out with a guy who'd already left the farm. You couldn't get in touch with him to come in and pick her up, which was going to be me. I don't know his name. I never knew his name. I don't. I would never have recognised him. So anyway, he comes. When he gets there, he finds out he's taking me and not her because she's gone off with a boyfriend. So we get, and it's a freshwater lake, <laughs> Eni Abba. So out there at this freshwater lake, no, they water skiing, never water skied before. I ended up diving in head first, hit it the top of my head on a submerged sandbank oh, and knew I was in trouble. So the boat stopped to pick me up, but the movement of the boat was painful. So mm. they stopped and put me on the shore and I walked around the shore back to where the, all his friends were sitting. And one of the guys there said, look, you've, done, you've hurt your neck. He said, look, I'll bring a friend of mine in Geraldton who's a chiropractor mm. and I'll drive you there, which is another hour and a half's drive to there. So... I've got to get in the car. You don't realise that you how much you use your head as balance. Yeah. So even sitting down, yep. getting up, getting in and out of a car, 
and it was over dirt roads, sand oh, dunes. Oh. And how heavy no your belt. head is too as it well. Pain. Yeah. Drives me to Geraldton. The, the chiropractor comes in, sees us, looks at me and she said, sweetheart, she said, um, it's a bit swollen. Why don't you come back and see me on Tuesday and I'll put it back in then. Oh, my God. Had, had she touched me, I would have been dead. So it, back in the car, drive oh. back to where we were, I was teaching. By this stage, 10.30 at night. And the boyfriend is ready to go back to the city. He said, why don't you come? I'll drive you back down to Perth. I'll drop you off at your place and you can see your own doctor tomorrow. So back to the city, 1.30 in the morning. I'm out of the car going, mum and dad are in bed. I go get myself into bed. Next morning, I've crawled out there, there, shock, call my doctor, meet me at the hospital. So I meet him at the hospital. They do an x-ray. Next thing, I've got sandbags all around me. Uh, I've got compression fractures on th th three and four mm, in my God. neck. So into hospital, I have to be on, um, what do they call it when they hang you by your chin in bed? Um, oh, like with a... Yeah, with the, weight, the um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I was above yeah. head height of um, anybody walking in the room, so I couldn't see them. So I was in trouble, and I find out, because I'd come from the middle of nowhere, we had no doctors, we didn't have dentists, mm. I'd never had injections. Yeah. And that, so I suddenly find out I'm allergic, they... In the night, I could control the pain in the day, but when I was supposed to be asleep, they gave me something to sleep. I had no control. I'd scream the hospital down. The next morning, they said, well, we can't inflict you on any other patients, so we're not. We're going to take you out of traction, and we're going to put you in plaster. So they stretched me, and I was in plaster from oh. the top of my head to a half oh, manoeuvre, shoulders out to here. I was in this plaster cast like this. Oh. Um, and... They, I said, look, pointless me staying in hospital. Nothing can happen to me now. So yeah. I called a friend who was going to pick me up and take me to down south to his parents' farm, and I could hide because I looked like the Mitchell man. I was just... Sweet. So he, he comes... He's, it take him a while to get there. So I go for a walk around the hospital ground, and I get a mosquito in my ear. Have you ever had an insect oh in your ear? Oh, my God. You are and having the worst run of luck. <laughs> when they pummel on your eardrum, mm, it's yeah. like a jackhammer in your brain. So... I've gone back into the hospital and they, to, to get it out, they've had to lift me up and lay me over, pour warm yeah. oil mm -hmm. in my ear to drown. Mm -hmm. And while they're doing this, I said, look, the only thing that can happen to me now, I get hit by a truck. You've got to watch what you say. So my friend arrives, <laughs> picks me up, we're in the, his car, drive out of the gate onto the hospital, onto the main road, whew, truck oh runs into the back, back of the car. What? <laughs> it's ridiculous. But I'm already in plaster, so oh I can't, my God. no whiplash. So I ended up. So you're probably lucky, right? That you yeah, were totally. already plastered. Already plastered. Jeez. I was it. Wow. So went down and stayed on his parents' farm until the plaster was to come off. And then they um, they use a saw mm. to cut across your mm. throat. You hear? Mm. Anyway, the plaster came off. I was in one of those screw up collars yep. for. Mm. Went back to school teaching. Um, it, and can uh, I ask at that point what what was the uh, outlook from the doctors? Oh, I was going to spend my life in a wheelchair. I'd never be able to have kids. I'd never play sport again. I'd never, I'd never, I'd never, I'd never, I'd never oh, stuff you. That's so a list. The day they took the collar off, I played a full game of basketball that night. I didn't take a break. I thought, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die doing something I want. <laughs> I'm going to make this shot. Absolutely. Yeah. I went water skiing again. I did all those things. Um, I did have troubles. When I was teaching in Sydney, I had to go back into a collar because I was losing the use of my arms. I couldn't lift my arms to write on the blackboard. So back in a collar. Um, and I'm, uh, they wanted to operate and cut the bones out and put a um, rod through. I wasn't keen on that. I met an old bloke who said he was a healer and asked me to give him three weeks and he would yep. work with me. So at that point in time, because yep. yep. I knew if I had a rod there, eventually I'd have a rod right through my yep. spine. So three weeks, he threw me over his shoulder, stretched me, did all that. I got the use of my arms back and I never had the operation. Unbelievable. So, Wowee. And did, did that sort of a thing, I mean, that sort of a event in someone's life, surely that would play a part in, you know, I guess the outlook you'd have in oh, today, totally. right? Because from that moment, when the doctor said all the things I wouldn't do, I thought, he's not in my body. He's yeah. got no idea what I'm yeah. doing. So from that moment on, health became the focal point. I'd taken all for granted, as you do, yeah. young mm -hmm. people, you do. Yeah. But suddenly health was it. So diet. You know, I'd studied nutrition. I mm. was, you know, you know, done all the, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't inhale anything, mm. I didn't, you know, I ate a healthy, you know, I had nutrition. So mm. total focus on health and well-being. Um, I did start to have trouble 
bit later and I took up regular chiropractic care. Mm. So, you know, it just, it changed me, my attitude to life completely mm. because you realise if you don't have your health, everything else mm. in life becomes problematic. Mm. But do you think that's where that came from? Because you sound like a, a fairly tenacious person. You're not <laughs> going to take no for an answer. Do you think yeah. that was part of that whole sort of mentality? Yeah, I think I was like that before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. You know, as I say, I was completely different from anybody else mm. in the family. I don't know where I got that from, but I wasn't going to allow anybody to stop me from doing what I wanted yep. to do. So it just... But that's a great mentality to have, especially um, for a female and back then, yeah. because a lot of people will listen to, to others telling them, no, no, you can't do that. That's, yeah. that's not possible, you, you know, yeah. because this, this and this. Yeah. It's like, no, no, that's not right. You, you've <laughs> got to set your mind to something and you can do it. Exactly. It's interesting because I, I had wanted initially to study medicine, but because of my scholarship, I had to do teaching. Yep. Um, so for me, having research, you know, I... I studied science, you know, all my science subjects except geology. I had to learn before I taught that one. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it gave me an approach to life that life is what you make it. Yeah. And so all the public speaking I've done yep. since then is life is what you make it yep. and with a focus on health and then the choices you make. So it's um, back then there were no books. There were no mm. people who had those philosophies. There was yep. nobody I could talk to. I was a yep. lone wolf in those days. Yeah. Mm. But it just, that's just the way it was. So. Mm, that's so interesting. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, I just find that fascinating because that, that, that's the thing that, that I find with a lot of people, they will just stop doing something because they're told they can't yeah. or they shouldn't. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's entirely up to you. You can do yeah. whatever you want. Mm. Mm. But yeah. growing up where I did, we didn't have doctors. We didn't have yeah. dentists. We had none of the things. We had no community yep. as such. So, you know, you just, you, you did what you did or else, mm. you know, there was nobody there going to hand it your life on a platter. Mm. You, yeah. You just... Today, that's yeah, a different story. Totally. People have so many opportunities and they yeah. still don't grasp them. Yeah. You know what I mean? They still yeah. let stuff go. And it's like, you, today, it's like so yeah. different to what it been, would have oh, been like back Completely then. and yeah. absolutely different. Nobody, you know, I, I, since I've been on the board of an education foundation in, in Melbourne since 2006, mm -hmm. and we take um, what we call um, challenged, disadvantaged mm -hmm. kids um, and who are exceptional, who are gifted yep. and put them through year 11 and 12 and then mentor them through uni. Yeah. So the fact that I could relate totally mm. to these kids has yep. made that, um, a, an absolute dream because I, I value education. I know what a difference it yep. can make and kids who are really bright, who don't have at network and don't have mm. the finances mm. should not miss out on life yep. because so m that experience as a child taught me a great deal yeah. that I've then been able to apply yeah. a lot through life. So I know it's a bit of a, a sidestep here, yeah. but what do you reckon these days you're hearing a lot about kids as young as 11, 12, stealing cars and, oh, and being God. lap bags? What, what is the solution to that? Because I don't know if it's social media that propagates this stuff, uh, but, but what is the solution to these kids who just seem to be running amok? Well, Peter and I had, were both very grateful for the upbringing we'd mm. had and the fact that we were now in the position where we actually had the means to help people. Yep. So before we set up the foundation at home, and Gordy, you'd, you'd remember a bit, there was always a lot of people in our house. Mm -hmm. So my kids didn't bring home wounded animals. They brought home <laughs> wounded kids. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> From all walks of life, Absolutely. including myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all of these... <laughs> nationality, yep. nothing. It didn't matter. So yep. we always had extra kids in the home. Yep. And I'd run, I ran retreats for women, a hundred women at a time once a year. So that was about, you know, life is what you yep. make it. So that was fine for women. And Peter said to me, Bevo, you've got to do something for guys as yep. well. I said, okay, as long as you're going to be there, because yep. it's going to be more relevant. So <laughs> we, we sort of um, would have the occasional residential, but yep. guys weren't really keen staying for the weekend. Yep. Women like, were, yep. they were fine. So we had, um, our kids would have the particular group of friends and a lot of them were in that troubled yep. variety. So we'd bring them home for the weekend and we'd have a great weekend and we'd all these motivational talk mm. and everything and they'd be fantastic and they'd have changed yep. and they go home and a couple of weeks later they come back and they're back in square yeah. one. Mm. Okay. And so we looked and thought, this is absolutely a waste of time. Mm. We've got to get the parents before, if you get the parents with the right approach, then the kids are going to be raised in the right environment. Yep. They're going to be fine. So we swapped it around from just having the kids and brought the parents in and yep. worked with them. 
And that's when I found that it, it made an enormous difference. So for me, looking at the kids, these young kids mm. today and having grandkids yep. at age, I could I look at my grandkids, there's no way known that they would even contemplate yeah. stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So I look at them and I look back on what we did and, and I know that the most important role any of us have in life is to have children and raise them. Mm. We're raising our next leaders, our yep. next generation of leaders. And if they're not raised in, in an appropriate fashion, we're going to dip out. Yep. So for us, it was important to get the kids instilled with a you know a good solid basis so that they, yeah. that sort of stuff didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. It had, we had mixed, for our eldest, he tried, he wasn't interested in the start. We had to plead with him to, to get involved with mm. these kids. And when he did, he um, came home one day and said, I'm leaving school. And I said, you yeah, what? Because <laughs> he was exceptionally bright. Yeah, I mean, okay. I've worked with, I had, I'd worked with uh, a post-grad work at uni in special ed, yep. gifted kids. So I knew he was bright. And I thought, God, you're not leaving school unless you've got a job. Yep. So you've got to watch what you say as a parent. <laughs> He goes to school on Monday. He comes home and he said, I've got these three jobs. Mum, I'm taking that one. I start next week. Oh, <laughs> oh, nice. And how old is he at this point? Uh, well, he was year 11. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. 11. Yeah. Yep. So he picked a job, which I was stunned in. It was with our race team. Yep. And he had not, our kids didn't particularly enjoy going to the races yep. because for Peter, it was always the fans. Yep. The kids had to wait until yep. they'd finished signing and then he'd, take them home yeah, and they'd be yep. starving and over it. So yeah. they yeah. didn't go very often. But Jamie started with the race team and we at the time had um, two guys who'd just come out of Formula One mm -hmm. and uh, I, I used to go in and f food and do stuff. And I, I went in one day a couple of weeks after Jamie started and they took me aside, these two guys, and they said, do you realise what you've got here? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, do you realise how capable your son is? I yeah, that's awesome. They said, do you understand he's been here a couple of weeks? He can do things that we could not do in Formula One. Mm. So <laughs> that, that is okay. amazing. Mm. So he stayed there for a little bit, but then he started his own business. He built a replica of Peter's first race car without wow. seeing it. That is amazing. Without anything. <laughs> and Peter would go in there and look. He said, this is so much better than what I ever did. Because <laughs> <laughs> Peter would do everything by eye and yeah. feel. Yep. Whereas yep. Jamie's meticulous. Yep. You know, he's everything yep. is just perfect. So it, it, um, you know, I looked at, here's this kid with this attitude to work, determination, perfectionist, yeah. all of that sort of stuff. So he tried to get some of his mates who had been coming to, um, he'd get them jobs yeah. and they'd never even turn up. And he, and he was so mortified that he just walked away from all of that. Wow. And, just, and so our kids, even though they grew up in a household which, where we always had extra kids, mm. there's no way, no one, our kids yep. are going to do it because they had to share their parents. They already had yeah. to share their dad. They yeah. then had to share their mum and mm. their home. Yeah. So it, it changed attitudes more than yep. you can begin to think. So Yeah, yeah. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. It is. In the midst of that, Bridgestone, yep. our favourite sponsor at the time, had an ad. You remember this, Cordy? Yes. Had an ad oh. for tyres. <laughs> is this the and one with the gecko? Yeah, but it's before the gecko. The gecko came in just after that. Okay. So, so I was, Peter and I were to be, they, they'd bought in the new uh, Supercat tyres. Yep. Oh, so right. we were to, to be <laughs> in a comparison on a, a, a disused airport yep. up in Sydney. And Peter was going to be so embarrassed because I was a pathetic driver. <laughs> so to, so it didn't show up on the ad. He took me down the paddock, set up witch's hats, taught me how to drive and did a couple of runs. That's fine. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Just so I didn't embarrass him. <laughs> so we, we get up to Sydney, the ad. I'm in the car with the old child. Yep. Peter's in the car with the new set yep. of cats. We do a thing, slam on the brake, stop. And he cleans me up by a country mile because he's got the good tyres. So yep. they swap cars. And I beat him. <laughs> I, I beat him. That. And he looked. <laughs> he said, Bevo, how good are those tyres? <laughs> And they were. And for me to have that so before good. and after yep. and understand how important tyres were yep. in stopping yep. and manoeuvring, yep. 
Gordy uh, came. Yes. Gordy yes. didn't have good tyres on his car. Uh, My daughter was not going to be allowed in that car until uh, he had good uh, tyres. So he got a brand new set of good tyres. I love that. <laughs> I was very embarrassed. That I'll get, I'll, so I, will get, I will get to that story in a second. second actually. Okay. <laughs> but um, I, I did want to sort of roughly go back to, uh, it, let's let's go to say it was the 70s at this point. Yeah. And um, I'm guessing, uh, when did you meet Peter? Was it around sort of the early 70s? Yes. Yes. Because, yeah. I mean... To, to me, that that was the era I wish I was born in. Yeah. I just think it's it's brilliant. It yeah. was, you can wear footy shorts for no particular reason, <laughs> carton of cigarettes on the uh, bottom of, uh, uh, you know, dashboard of your car. Uh, it was just sunnies on. It was a, the, the cars were awesome, but it was a, a real roaring, wild time. Yeah. Um, what was, what was that time like for you when the 70s hit and I guess you met Peter? Um, it was interesting because I, I'm this kid from this, isolated spot. I know nothing. Mm. I'm naive. I've never dealt with media. I've never dealt with high profile people. I've never, you know, all this sort of stuff. And you got to, I know you were saying about the footy shorts, women were not allowed to wear trousers to work. <laughs> I, I, my science lab was sort of in the hill and it, and it was, didn't get above freezing until 11 o'clock. So I went to the school principal and said, I want permission to wear trousers because it's so mm. damn cold. Mm. Absolutely, it's against the rules, absolutely. And he and the deputy principal, and as I was walking out, I'm thinking, oh, God, and I heard him say, besides which, what would we have to look at? Because mini oh, skirts were in. God. And I thought, Jeez. mate, <laughs> you've challenged the wrong woman. So yes. the next day, <laughs> I wore slacks, long trousers. There was only six other females teaching in the school. That is and awesome. within a week, they were all wearing trousers. Oh, that is awesome. So, oh, I love that. But anyhow, how did I, I find that. that era? It was great. It was raw. It was amazing. Um, I then got to see, I'd seen a little bit of motor racing in West Australia, but um, with Peter, get, we'd go out to the track all the time. Uh, I was sort of learning to drive, but then I, no, no, this, this, you know, this is the big boys go, and I <laughs> wasn't really all that interested in driving. Um, yeah, the cars, all of that sort of stuff. I was around the cars because we had a service station. We were, the, mm. the racing was there. Um, when Peter wanted assistance, he'd get my then husband to fly down and, and join him. So I would come because that meant I was doing the cooking and the waiting yep. on them and the <laughs> dog's breakfast stuff. <laughs> so um, to to actually find that I was involved in a, you know, at that stage, Peter had not really started winning. He was just at the start yeah. of all of that. Yeah. And so he had won Bathurst and I was at school. I'd been up there on the weekend. I was at school on the Monday. I organised for him on his way home. To back to Melbourne to drive past and stop at the school, and you can imagine a boys' high school. Yeah, he's I just got <laughs> just one bathroom. Yeah. He gets yes. up there and he's up on the stage, and there's this, you know, <laughs> these all these young men just in. And the principal said to me afterwards, "Do you think he can teach us to talk like this? We don't get that reaction when we're talking." <laughs> <laughs> so I got at that point in time, I got to experience good cars, mm. really good cars. Yeah which I got to drive sometimes. Sometimes I had them at school and would take the, the kids when I, because I, I coached the basketball team then, I'd take a couple of the players in the car, the <laughs> super car. They used to think it was fantastic. They would have loved Absolutely that. Absolutely fantastic. They loved it, yeah. Watching the old Bathurst footage and, and things like that, especially of the early 70s, just things like the pit lane stuff, like <laughs> it was such a while, like the way they would fill up a car would almost yeah. be with a big funnel and a, yeah. and, a, and a barrel and pit fires and things like that. It was before sort of, um, I, I, I'm not sure what they call them, but the valves and stuff that yeah. they, they moved to in the sort of very, early 80s. Very manual. Yeah. yeah. There was no pit structure as such. There was yeah. a wooden counter. There was a single barbed wire, single line of barbed wire fencing. That was it. That was the safety thing over the mountain. Didn't and Peter actually used to say because the council would say they're bringing in these safety guys and they'd be putting up. The, Peter said, "No, it takes away the challenge. Don't don't do that." But of course they had to. Yeah. You know, a few blokes lost their lives, so it yeah. tends to change things. But well, yeah. even up on the mountain, uh, if you're a spectator, they were burning cars and doing all sorts Couches of stuff up and, there. Yeah. That was that was a time to be alive. <laughs> well, you had to have to get up there. You had to go up this road, and there would be a group of the guys from up the <laughs> hill, and to. If you uh, had a female in the car and she lifted a T-shirt, show them she wears, they would let that car through. That is so good. If, if it had only had blokes in it, yeah. they'd have to contribute a certain amount of their slab or they'd have to do a burnout. The trouble is when they did the burnout, the car would slide off and mm. sometimes went yeah. through tents where people were sleeping. Oh my God. But the media protected it all. They didn't, 
all of that was kept quiet. And up the exactly, top, exactly, yeah, up the top where it was drinking, yep. they brought in the limit for the the amount of alcohol mm. you could have. The guys weren't stupid, so they would go <laughs> up there mid th way through the year, dig a trench from their campsite <laughs> to the where the power thing was, and hook into the power, cover the trench over. Mm. And they'd have under their tent site, they'd have a big hole, and they'd have a big fridge in there, so it's connected to the power. Unbelievable! And they so they they would have their stock supply and before the police arrived on race week. Can you believe this? Is, this whole thing's my kind of currency. But, I just like how they're doing but, it. It's up to you getting your Tirana in. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's true. The media it was, did cover yeah. that up. I mean, that, yeah, that they was... They covered it all up. Yeah, Never totally, happened. There yeah. were a few people killed, a few people squashed when the burnouts went a bit haywire. But, but you know, Peter and I'd go up, and because the guys would be there in their army greatcoats with yep. every badge they could find, and they <laughs> idolised him. So they treated, always yep. treated me with absolute respect, yep. and they treated him with respect. Yep. But if you were a bit of a hoon or anything, you had to pass certain tests before you were part of the mob to stay there. So mm. it was never dull or boring, I can imagine. let me tell you. What do you think it is about the, the, the fan base of, I mean, not just Peter, but motor racing and cars in general is, it's such a fascinating uh, love affair. I mean, uh, you know, when my parents were 16 years old, they they would do up our dad's MG. And for them, back then, that was their, their campfire. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And um, for a lot of like fans working on cars together or talking about cars, debating about cars, it's it's a passion. It's a clubhouse. Yeah. Um, and to see Peter, I guess it was almost like their their, their god, you yeah. know, their, their, uh, their king. They are. They, it was interesting because it didn't matter whether you were a Ford fan, didn't matter what, you know, mm. model you were in, they respected Peter. Mm. He was he was applauded by all of them, and and so it was to me it was always interesting. And there was a, back in those days there was a lot of camaraderie. So if you saw somebody having trouble, you helped them. Mm. You know, we often mm. gave sets of tires or uh, sent one of our mechanics down to help up the the, the guys who were just breaking yep. into it, who didn't have yep. money and couldn't do yep. it. So, but you know, it came a time when. You you had to you you weren't allowed to be seen talking to anybody from another team because you might be spreading mm. the secrets, mm. and it just developed into this. Uh, and then when Tony Cochran took over, he wanted it to be the equivalent of the Formula mm. One, mm. and so another level of yeah. you know uh, that extreme. So all of that that uh, friendliness, the camaraderie, had to go under cover, mm. and it, and it was it was sad because at the end of a race on Sundays, you know, the whole heap of teams would get together for. Mm. A, drinks and a yep. barbecue and it was you know everybody talked and shared things but you know it came a time when um peter was getting towards the end of his career when he wasn't allowed to lift the bonnet of his car <laughs> in his own team he wasn't allowed to talk to the mechanics mm. he wasn't they were bringing in you know craig and, and the younger drivers mm. and they wanted but they wanted peter because he bought with him huge fan base mm. huge sponsor mm. support mm. Um, and announced that they didn't have, so they wanted him and, and this isn't, the guys in the team were fantastic. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking administrative wise. Mm. So they wanted him, they needed him for all those reasons, but having got them, those things, mm. got his sponsors signed mm. over now with their yep. signature on the thing. Yep. Suddenly, and he looked at me and he said, Bevo, he said, this is, this is just awful. First race meeting for that year was at Winton and it, it was it was so embarrassing the poor bugger was just you know couldn't look at his car couldn't talk to mm. the team and the drivers and so by the time we hopped in the car to come home he, he was really gutted and I said to him well why hang around why mm. not say now it's yeah. say now that you're going to retire at the end of the year that way it gives you every race meeting around yep. the country yep say goodbye sign all the autographs and get you out of this situation so he went through a couple of years at the end there that were just abysmal. I, I was just horrified with how it how it worked for somebody who had brought so much yeah. to the sport mm. that was given such mm. a tough time by people who corporate. they wanted him, corporate they wanted him, but they wanted to control him. They yeah. had to control him yeah. for them to get what they wanted out of it, and that was total insult. But anyhow, that's that's the joys of you know, change mm. happening, evolution mm. of drivers coming and going. And, and you know, I, I look at some of it now and I think, yeah, there's some little bits of that shows up nowadays. Not yeah. not quite the same. Mm. But it's not the same these days. If you look at supercars, they're just, there's so little resemblance to a road yeah. car. Back then yeah. it used they to be. They all look the same. Exactly. They're, and under the skin, they're yeah. very similar. 
Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, it's it's a bit sort of disappointing, you know. Um, it is. I go occasionally, yeah. um, and I watch occasionally yeah. on TV, but um, it's not the same. Yeah, and and I just I look. There was a time when the sport applauded heroic individuals. Yeah. So the likes of Dick and Moff yep. and Peter and John Bow and those were were individuals and had a big following yeah. in their own right. Well, when the change happened and, and it became sort of supercars, they they the ruling was that no one person, no one team mm. would get more support than another, and therefore no individual could stand out. Mm. So rather than have a person that the fans could yep. relate to, yep. it's common field, and you sit there and think no. And they'd, they'd have a go at the guys who dared to speak up and that's mm. oh, hang on, they've got personalities. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That's yeah. what you see yeah. these days. Anyone exactly. that does speak, speak up, up, they get slapped down. Yeah. It's exactly. like, well, why Sad. can't they just have an opinion? Yeah. Mm. Yep. What's the problem? You know? It is. A, it's a shame. And I, I sort of, I, on one level, I feel for them. But on the other hand, they've never experienced anything else. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And a lot right. of them, because they've never owned the team, they've never yeah. had to mm. do the media, they've never had to get the sponsors. They, don't, they biff and bang and they don't care if they knock yep. somebody else off the track and yep. total somebody else's car. They don't have to pay for the repairs. Mm. They don't have to go through all of that stuff. And I, I look and I think, you know, the amount of or lack of respect that some of them, the younger ones have today, mm. um, because they don't have ownership in, yep. the, in the team. They're employed driver. Yeah. Whereas we go back to the time where Dick, Glenn Seaton, you know, um, Peter, you know, the they owned the team. Yeah. The financial risk was yeah, all so out. Race differently as well because exactly. you don't want to. <laughs> you can't. And it, it, all that happened every time was the mortgage on our home just got bigger and bigger. Mm. You know because you've got to find more money. So for Peter, the sponsorship money came in, and that was for the go fast bits, mm. Bibbo. So you can so the you can do the cooking, you can feed mm. the crew, you can do the timing, you can make the costume, the girls' costumes, you can <laughs> fix our race suits, you can make our race suits. All of that was mine. Yep. Mm. And look after Peter at the same time. Yep. Um, and and the sponsorship money came in for the go fast. Yep. And look good. Yeah. Because it's got to look good. Yep. So, you know, there was one year in Bathurst where you, if you led for a, a lap in qualifying, mm. you, you fastest lap, leading the laps in the race, blah, blah, everything. And he won everything that was possible yep. to win. It was a dream mm. thing in that yep. sense. But by the time you paid... Your co-drivers, because mm. you give them, promise them. Mm. All your crew, if you win, you get a yep. certain thing. We didn't meet costs. Wow. We'd won everything and still didn't meet costs. So people automatically assumed that because you were there and you're at the leading edge, mm. you were wealthy. Yep. But like everybody else, you were yep. struggling to to tell, be there. Tell us how that works. Like if you're if if you run a race team, you guys are paying for everything. When it comes to, to sponsorships, mm. do they always have strings attached? I mean, they, they'll get something on the car, but does it mean that, that uh, Pete would have to go and do yeah, you so know, TV ads yeah. and talks and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, at one point in time there, uh, when Peter was king of Moomba and uh, Queen, he came out. Yep. And uh, <laughs> we were invited to have lunch with the Queen. And Peter had wow. said yes initially. And then Mobile had a function on for their dealers. And they said, we need you there. So we... Joking. Walked out. We didn't go to lunch with the Queen. <laughs> we we did the mobile function. <laughs> Can you imagine that conversation? <laughs> Sorry, Liz, can't make it to the sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to go do this thing for a bloody petrol company. <laughs> he had to get permission to wear it, cloth, his cloth crown because one you can't you cannot wear a crown in front of a royalty if they've got their crown on. Oh, she had her crown on, so the king of the versus the Queen. <laughs> No, it's just you know all of these yeah. these things. I mean, it was <laughs> there was always something, something. Yeah. always something, which was in one level exciting, but it was exhausting. No, I can it, you imagine. Know, you know, people would say to me, "Oh, you know, you're so lucky." And I like, swap places with me for a few weeks, Absolutely. mate. Absolutely, you know, it was it was full on. Yeah, a I lot can of imagine. Work. I mean, just being a race driver, uh, being part of the support crew is. Full time yeah. stuff, let so, alone a thousand him, different yeah. engagements. Well, he because he had all the business meetings, all the media stuff, mm. the, you know, the fan stuff. He, he was constantly in demand. I don't know. I honestly don't know how he survived and coped with it all. Well, I was going to say you should play. You do play a, a big part in that because, um, from what I hear as well, it's Peter was this <laughs> sort of ball of. 
chaotic energy <laughs> and you really were the sort of the, the, the calm um, and focus behind him yeah. and um, prevented, I guess, so he doesn't burn out, you know? Yeah. Well, totally, because for, for me it was, uh, you know, and, and I know it's going back to the old gender, mm. the roles, but at that stage for me it was in order for him to do and be the success he needed to be, he needed to have a good sound support base. Yeah. Peaceful. So we had a an understanding with the, the crew and myself that if there was any problems at all, he doesn't know about them. When he gets to the racetrack, he is there for the fans, for the sponsors, yep. for the race, for the car. Anything that's a problem, we'll deal with it. Yep. So, you know, there were when we sort of split with Holden and they had, had issued uh, <laughs> legal papers at practice day, at the first practice day, the, the pits, do we keep these away from him? Yep. Do we, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yep. So it was on one hand people would say but you're treating him like a child and the other hand if you had to do what he oh, had to do can you imagine though having yeah. that in the back of your mind just as you're about to go racing, racing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Be hard that's, work. that's not treating like someone like a child that's giving them the best chance at success yeah it was for me it was the, the time of learning about the media mm. you have to pardon me if i yeah. tread on toes here guys but at one point in time uh this is when we're splitting from holden and the media want interviews, mm, interviews. Yep. And if he was going to be doing all the interviews, he wasn't going to be working at trying to get, where do we build the cars now? Who do we employ? Who do we, blah, blah. So he was doing that. So I would do the media yep. interviews. And I had never had to deal <laughs> with media before. So I've got this interview with this guy and he, and he comes out. And I didn't understand what, what he got me in there. And his opening thing was, he sets me up. They've got the lighting. Yep. Yeah. Um, and he sets me up and, and he says to me, um, isn't this Peter hiding behind your skirts? Oh, God. And I looked at him and I said, what a disgusting thing to say. So it was 7.30 or something. Yeah. Like that. So the promotion for that to go to TV, what a disgusting oh. thing to say was what they did. And then people in the media, when they saw it, said to me, you understand he was setting you up? And I said, what do you mean he was setting you up? Well, for a start, he's got the camera set yeah. down, though, that looks up. He's got the lighting set down. He's got a green lens on the camera. So it all is designed to make you hawkish, yeah. throw shadows. Oh. Yeah. All of those things. And I'm sitting there thinking, seriously? Anyhow, I didn't find that out until after. Yeah. But it, it taught me then the strategies that people would go to, the yep. media would go to. Yes. So I get home from there. I deal with him. I get home from there. The phone's ringing. It's radio stations mm -hmm. in South Australia. And they'd heard... Mm. So you, you realise then that all the media around Australia yep. listen to anything that might be interesting. Exactly. They've got somebody listening and they yep. then... And that is yep. the beginning, in a media sense, that yep. is the beginning of setting a narrative. Yeah, mm. and and fair enough, and I understand all that. But when you add that, it's okay when even... Because he'd been the media's golden head boy, mm. and suddenly they decided he's the one we go for mm. because it's big stories. Mm. And so to see him feeling mortally wounded because mm. he'd never done anything wrong. Yep. Um, and to know that in order for him to get through this, he, he we need to have a, a very calm situation. And mm. so we took care of all of the, the tough stuff mm. and maybe we did treat him like a... But then he he didn't have time for it all, so, yeah. which mm. is fair enough. Mm. So did you learn from that experience oh. with the media? Did you treat every future interview differently? I looked more carefully, but Peter yep. actually said to me, Bevo, he said, make sure that everybody you talk to in the media has your our home phone number, yep. our fax details, our emails, all of that. And I said to him, why? And he said, if you don't and they write a story mm. and you've refused to participate, he mm. said, you've got no right to complain about where yep. that's wrong. Yep. And so, <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> He'd give everybody a uh, home phone number and my details and somebody would come up to them with a personal problem, a health problem. Oh, I just got to call Bevo. Here, here's a number. <laughs> so the phone, had, he'd, he'd be come home and be sitting at the kitchen bench, the phone would ring and I'd talk on the phone because somebody's, yeah, the, my brother's dying and blah, 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 blah. And I put it on the phone. He said, Bevo, don't do that. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't talk on the phone when I'm here. I'm not home very often. I want to have your attention. You're the one that's giving them my number. You're the one that's telling them I have the solutions. And and so, so it was sort of it was it got very complex. And yeah. Just you know it was, you know. And 
can I say, on top of all that, there was also <laughs> creating a home life as well. Yeah. And, and um, running a 200 acre property. Yeah. Oh, it was <laughs> I actually don't know how you do that. It's like, a stunning property. It yeah. was a stunning property too. Yeah. And we had Peter's parents living. We built a house for them on our block. Yep. And it had his aunt and uncle living next door who didn't have any children. And my father had dementia and came over. So I had, we had all these oldies and in about five years, uh, no, in yeah, over a period of about three years, we lost five of them. Yep. So I was nursing them at mm -hmm. home as oh, well. So goodness. it was, I you sit back to be now. You commended because that's, that's well, no, I don't say it for that reason, but I look back because it's there to be done. You do it. You, yeah. don't, you don't look at anything else. Yep. You just do it. And I look at, you know, the young ones now when they have their kids and they need help and I think, yeah, do you? <laughs> no, but seriously, like that's yeah, that's a good point. Someone, yeah, yeah. we yeah. we didn't get that help, and then we had yeah. no, there was no early learning centre, no mm. daycare centre, oh, nurse on call, all that sort of yeah, stuff. You know, none of that. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was always uh, it was always such a welcoming and um, warm uh, place to to go to. Yeah, you know, that's my memories of. Of, uh, of your place. And I remember <laughs> you were talking about the tyre situation yes. before. I remember this one time, <laughs> God, and I'm in, like, I'm genuinely, there's two things that I'm genuinely embarrassed to talk about, but, uh, and I didn't think Alex would remember, but she, 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 she remembers, brought, she, oh, she, remembers she brought them up. <laughs> one, one time was, and it was, it was a, it, it actually gave me a lifelong lesson in, um, in kindness was I had the I had this little Suzuki Swift, right? <laughs> and I used to drive it was my first car and I'd drive it from, you know, to into um Nutfield at the time and oh the the tires were bald on it. And one <laughs> time it was like two o'clock in the it was I was driving home at like two o'clock in the morning or something like that. And um I ran off I ran off the road into a, a, some sort of a ditch, into some poor uh, person's <laughs> fence, which was a barbed wire fence. Oh and I was too embarrassed to like call call for help or anything. So there I am, two o'clock in the morning. It was pissing down with rain. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read, I'm trying to pull this barbed wire <laughs> fence off my little car and then try and get, get up it. the ditch. And then- <laughs> um in an interesting spot. <laughs> then uh, some, some guy pulls over and goes, oh, you need a hand? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, please. Please don't be the person who lives in this house. <laughs> and uh, he said, "Oh, you, you, I live just over, I, I live just over there." I'm like, oh, "Okay, yeah, people come off the road here all the time." I've radio anyway. So he sort of puts me, uh, helps me take this thing off. I drive out of the ditch, and uh, the next day, I, I think I pulled up in in your driveway with a scratched up car, <laughs> and you just went, "What? I, I, okay, you can't, you can't be doing this. You can't be doing this." And I'm, obviously, you know, y you can't have uh, your daughter's boyfriend at the time driving around with bald <laughs> tyres. Let's let's get that fixed. But um, it was also such a such a selfless act of kindness, and I I I I, I remembered that a lot. And um, yeah, it, within Bev made one phone call, and within within an hour, I was down at some yep. garage putting. Uh, some, some nice Bridgestone new. Firestones on there. <laughs> Fantastic tyres. Shout out to Bridgestone. Yeah. The, the um, amazing company. But yeah, there was actually this other time, right, where I had a um, I had a problem with that with my car. It just wouldn't start, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a problem with my car. It wouldn't start. I'm like, what is going on here? And I was I was still I was quite nervous around around Peter, um, and. I was like, oh, there's some, something wrong with my car. And, you know, he was just enjoying a movie on the yeah. couch and he sort of comes out. He's like, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just just sort of pops the bonnet. Yeah, just give it a start. Yeah, maybe it's the battery. Hang on, hang on a sec. Hang on. And he sort of goes inside and boils the kettle. And <laughs> sometimes it can be a bit of uh, thick tar around the connections, you know, <laughs> sort of pour some boiling water over there. Yeah. And then he, um, he sort of... <laughs> comes around to my driver's side door and I'm in there and he just gives me this look <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> and he just gives me this kind of wry look, a mixture of like this sort of smirk and it also, mate, <laughs> and he just goes, put it into park. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. 
Uh, You're uh, a disgrace. Uh, <laughs> I think about that and I cringe. Uh, but uh, you but, know. But the, look, with him with cars, he he had this uncanny neck, which is why he could drive cars that other guys would hop in and yes. would drive. But when it came to home cars, it same thing happened. And I I left him home one Saturday morning, and I had taken our car and gone up to St Andrews Markets. Mm. The local big markets, yep, everybody yep. has a ball. Park the car. <laughs> I go into the markets. I come out, get back in the car to go home, turn the key on. Won't start. Smoke. Smoke pouring into the mm. cab and I can smell it. I turn the key off. I thought, oh, God. Lifted up the bonnet, went and looked. Couldn't see anything. Looked underneath, couldn't see anything. Had another go. Smoke. Oh, God. So a couple of the young guys in the district who had worked on our, mm. were working on our place, walked past and I said to them, look, I've got problems. The car, you know, it, it go to start it and it's smoking. Oh, we have to go Bevo. So they hop in and <laughs> go to start, smoke. <laughs> they want, don't want to touch. They don't want to see the whole yep. car go up. One of, you know, good Holden cars go up and smoke. So <laughs> I said, look, it's all right. I'll ring Peter and get him to come up. They said, are you sure? Said, yeah, I'll ring him to come up. So I've rung him and told him as he's come up. He said, Bevo, what's going on? I explained to him, you know, turn the key on, smoke everywhere. Oh, God, Pepe, so he hops in, turns the key on, the car starts immediately, no smoke, drives <laughs> up. Just got the touch. That is, and the guy's are standing that. there, I'm looking there, and I thought, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but that's the thing, that he had something, I, and I could never understand it. He had a connection where he, he and a car, whatever car, yep. were just, they understood each other. They mm, just, you that know. That's awesome. And it, <laughs> you sort of... It's intimidating because it makes you very wary about asking him yeah. next time round. Yeah, especially when he comes along and it just switches on. <laughs> he did tell me at one stage, and apologies to anybody listening to this who <laughs> thinks you know badly of Peter for this, but on one, he he didn't drink, and he if he did have a drink, it what he wasn't a good drinker by any means, <laughs> what you'd call a two pot screamer. <laughs> um, so I would have to drive if he yeah. had a drink, which is fine. So. Driving one night, and he because he was a shocking back street, backseat driver. He taught me, he gave me driving <laughs> lessons for 28 years, and I never succeeded apparently. <laughs> but this particular time driving him home, he's giving me an instruction, and I obviously didn't, I wasn't quite perfect enough. He said, Bevo, giving you a good car to drive is like feeding strawberries to pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, that is so gold. I stopped the car, <laughs> slammed on the brakes, got out, walked around to the passenger side. <laughs> Get over there, mate. So whether he was drunk or not, we weren't that far from home. But he could just uh, say, <laughs> because he assumed that everybody else had that connection with yes, cars, and we yep, didn't. Yep. It's just the way it was. It's, yep. such, a, it's such a focus. Uh, I've always admired that sort of thing because when you – uh, are in a car of that capacity and you're on a, a racetrack or whatever, there's so much, um, there's, there's focus and there's feel and there's so much like natural intuition uh, when you're feeling sort mm. of a road. It's not just, it's everything, all your senses. And I think that's um, that's one of the things about the Bathurst uh, 1000 as well. It's But that's the point of difference because everyone can have the same car but it comes down to that next yeah. little bit, and that's it's that next little bit that yeah. gets you the win. Yeah. You know. well, the, earlier in the piece at Calder, for example, they had a series of races where they all drove the same car yeah, okay. with the same engine capacity, yep. and he still won. Yep. Wow. So, you know, and it was that's, just, that's yeah. the key difference, right? Yeah. That's that's where you're willing to, to take perhaps a bit more risk and you're willing to, to put more on the line to, yeah. to get that win. And that's where you're going to you're going to find the the difference, you know. Mm. Hey, with that stuff, I mean, you know, occasionally you'd get high profile sports people who'd yep. get a hot lap. Yep. A surprising number of them embarrass themselves in the <laughs> in the journey when they're getting out yeah. of the track. Yeah. It, it was just you know one of those things that um, he could, you know. I mean, you look at the the Bathurst where he won by six yep. laps. I mean, yeah, it couldn't huge. happen again because these days, you know, yep. when you've got the safety cars and yep. all that sort of stuff. But that was the easiest race he ever won, ever drove. You know, to him, the races that meant most were the yep. ones where he, he, for one, some, one reason or another, had to start from the back of the grid. Yep. And then to come through and win that race, he'd say, yep. yeah, that one's a that's good one. That's an achievement. That, you know. That's an achievement. Yeah. But in, in terms of, uh, you know, ordinary races, it was never, he was never interested in what the opposition were doing. Mm. The crew could go and find out, yep. but he didn't care. He said, all we do 
is we focus on what we're doing yep. the best we can, best I can, go down the straight the best, turn that corner the best. That's where my focus yep. is, nowhere else. Yep. And so he taught me about the whole thing of forget everything else. Mm. It's what you're doing right yep. now in that now moment. And one year we had, Holden had young lions. Yep. So they were yep. bringing the young drivers through. And we, and each of the leading teams had one of the young lions. So we, we got one. And Peter was intent on teaching him, talking to him, mm. all that sort of stuff. And we've walked into our caravan one time and he's sitting there and he's got this motivational speaker with him who's making him rehearse his speech when he won the race at the end of the day. Hasn't he? Uh, really? Yeah. We've, looked, oh. we've told her to leave and we've said to him, mate, oh that's not how God. it works. That is crazy. Here. That straight, round the corner, up yeah. the next straight. Nowhere else. You're not thinking about the end of the race. You're thinking about here. Yeah. yeah. And the guy said, yeah, 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 great. So the warm-up comes for the race. Before mm. the race starts, mm. you get a lap where you take the cars yep. and warm them up. What does he do? He gets up coming around the top, cranks the car. Oh, oh my God. Does he get to start the race? Oh, he's busy <laughs> thinking about his victory speech. Yeah. Yes. Unbelievable. And so it, it's opportunities like that yeah. that I, you know, Peter was so profound. He was so strong with the messages that mm. he got out and for the ones who listened like craig listened because yep. he was young um mm. they made a great thing but there's a lot of other drivers there that were fantastic drivers but they didn't necessarily have the engineering know how mm. they didn't necessarily have patience with the media yep. they didn't have the fan base followers yep. all of those various things made a huge difference which is why you know, Peter and Moff and that stood out because they had more than just a driver, yeah. a driving skill. Yep. You know, it's, it is a, a package, you know, yeah. you, as you say, there's so much going on, it's so full on. But unless you're, uh, you know, I look at these race drivers, they're not just hoons, they are intelligent, mm. amazing individuals who have managed to stitch together all these various all attributes yeah. and make something of it. Well, yeah. it seems Lounsey has done a fair fair yeah. job at that. Like he he's really good with the media. Yeah. Um, he seems very patient and and an excellent driver as well. Yeah. And I think he learned a lot. He you know, did getting he all and of Peter those were skills. Really good. Yeah. yeah, I won't mention names, but there were a couple of others who didn't listen and yep. and were very happy to go around and criticise whenever. They didn't think anyone was listening, but it always come back. Absolutely, yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a very small world. Well, it's it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm curious, were there ever discussions for Peter to get into F1? Because I know that that he, would have been the next logical step, right? No, he he drove open wheelers here. He had um, a, an open wheeler in in a category mm. early in the piece, and his father worked on the car for yep. him, which was great. But as he said, Bevo. The fans don't support it here yep. in Australia. The sponsors don't support it. What's yeah. the point in me yep. putting all my time into this yep. yeah. when it doesn't have the support in Australia? And, you know, he he was asked to race overseas. He, I mean, he drove uh, early in the back in the early 70s. He drove at um, a spa with Jerry Marshall, yep. for the English driver. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he got a lot of requests to drive there because then we did spa and yep. Le Mans and that yep. sort of stuff. Yep. So mm -hmm. he... But that was driving a car that Australians related to, and therefore yep. he had he didn't have any yep. trouble getting sponsorship. Yep. Yep. Uh, did he like being away from home? Absolutely not. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> Who else was going to cook him and lay his clothes it. out in the morning and put his map for his, his he'd get his um, schedule for the day, and I'd f have it photocopied and I'd have the page of the the back then. <laughs> <laughs> the, the road directory and have it all that laying out waiting for him so that he because that it's the only way he could get yeah. with his change of clothes because he'd have to go from a, a media meeting to a board meeting to the, you know so he'd have yeah. to have the full range yeah. of gear so you'd oh. have to lay his clothes his information all of that that is amazing mm. he was very fortunate to have you i mean that's that's mm. pretty awesome he was yeah yeah no, just, that's... yeah but that's you know i mean it was a joint venture yeah <laughs> And uh, when sort of it was all coming to end, he said, Bevo, he said, I think I've taught you everything you need to know. You'll be fine now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be right. <laughs> yeah. Can, can, can I ask, actually, yeah. it, it, it's cool if you don't want to, if you don't want to go there, but that, that, um, that day, uh, in when he was doing the Tiger West yeah. and you get that phone call about his passing, yeah. um, I mean, that, that's a phone call. Was that a phone call the way you found out? It was, but it, I don't know who called. And it, it was a woman's voice. And she just said, there's been an accident. And, and for me, and having teenage kids at the time, I'm thinking, which one of the kids? Mm. And she said, no, it's, it's not the kids. She said, it's Peter. He hasn't made it. And hung up the phone. And so 
oh, I've got this phone call and I'm sitting there thinking, and I've got to let the kids know. Mm. But I can hear a helicopter. And I looked out the window and the, and the cars. And so the media are landing in the paddock, the, driving up the drive, the camera's whirring. I've got to go out and talk to them. And I hadn't told the kids. Mm, so Jamie, the eldest, was doing an interview with somebody for a magazine. Mm. And the, he, the, the guy doing the interview got a phone call. And Jamie was saying, just looked at this guy. He's gone white. He didn't think, mm. what's wrong? The guy had to tell him. Mm. Uh, oh. Rob worked with um, his soon to be fiance at computer share so I could ring her and get her to tell mm. him and Alexandra had gone to the movies gone mm. to see a mm. gold all she'd said was she'd gone to the gold star movie and I knew what movie it was so I had to look and find out and get a I thought god when she gets out of there mm. her phone's going to go so, so I got a girlfriend to go and sit out mm. track down and sit outside mm -hmm. so you don't get the privilege when you got a pr public profile yep. you don't get the privilege we had no private time and we'd no sooner dealt with that and the funeral comes and and you're sitting there and, you, and then the media stuff for the the will went on for nearly two years so mm. <laughs> it was it That's was just... excuse me it was a shit time yeah <laughs> it was I not an that. easy like, time and, and, yeah, and that in, in, in that time it, do you have time to yourself uh does yeah. it take is it years after where you can sort of sit down and and, and process it is there uh, look it, the interesting thing is I, I was teaching life skills at the uh, local community living and learning center and I'm thinking about my kids and I'm thinking about the fact that I'm teaching life skills, how to cope with stress. And I thought, if I stuff this up, if I fall apart now, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be an example for my kids and I'm, I will have no right to teach mm. life skills yep. because if you can't manage it. So the whole time I've got this conversation going on in my head, you have to do this, you have to stay on top, you have to do all that. But then, you know, also had to sell the farm all the legal stuff there were five six legal teams working mm. on all this stuff and you just it just was an ongoing yeah. nightmare you know you just it's a debacle that you, you but you don't have any choice it's mm. there you've got to deal with it so yeah these yeah. processes are make, meant to make stuff simple but they, they don't definitely don't they don't no. and and for, for me i have to be completely honest the media were amazing they hated what they were having to mm. do but there was a job they had to yeah. do it and you know, they were other. There was two slight examples where one a uh, woman from Sydney and one was a, a guy here in Melbourne that were a little bit off. But mm. it, I have ha been given a really good run by the yep. media. So and okay. and because they appreciated the awkward situation I was yep. in. So you know, they've they've been very kind. So mm. yeah, okay. Um, you were talking about this just before. Um. Uh, you came in, but we we're talking about the fact that, say, Targa Tassie's been paused oh. and well, and Targa it, altogether, altogether. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah how, how do you feel about that? On one hand, I'm torn because you know people, and I'll say guys, and I'm not meaning you know, but it's more men, mm. far more men than what women yep. do. You know, that's the reality. They are adrenaline-driven mm. junkies, mm. most of them. And they enjoy that, and they should be able to do it. But if, as Targa Tassie has shown of late, that you know it's lost far too many yeah. good drivers, that conditions are not what they need to be. I I feel very much for the families when the drivers or the navigators mm. and that lose their life. I feel for them because I know what they're going through. I hated it when people said to me, ah, but he died doing what he loved. Mm. What a load of toss. Mm. I mean, here's this guy who's taught yep. class driving all these years. He's the 05 mm. face. Mm. He's all of these things about responsible and class mm. driving and, and being, you know, watching what you do on the road. For him to have died in that fashion was would have been the most embarrassing thing mm. for him ever. And so it pissed me off when people yep. would say, oh, but he died doing yep. what he loved. Absolute toss. Yep. Absolute toss. Because six weeks before he died, he had rung me and had, had told me that he he was sorry. He had failed as a, as a partner, as a father, as a, a member of the community. He never um, contributed anything worthwhile. And he absolutely believed that. And I thought mm. it... It was sad because we didn't see it that way. Mm. We didn't see him as a failure in any way. I mean, I don't know how he did all the things he did. But it, it just gave me the inclination, in, uh, understanding that at 
people were not talking about mental mm. illness in sport. It was only just starting. I mean, we're talking 16 years ago. Yep. Um, so the fact that he was retiring and didn't want to, yep. he was a Peter Pan, a pet perpetual yep. young thing, um, that was big enough on its own. And, and he didn't, he said to me that the reason he'd rung me was to actually tell me that he had finally retired. Mm. He was it, that was it, no more, Bevo. He said, I, I know it would mean more to you to hear that than anybody else. Yep. And, and, you know, he said all the other things, so that's fine. But then the day that I find out he's died, I find out he's in that event. We didn't even know he was in the event. He hadn't had the courage to tell us because right. he'd already broken yep. it to us that he retired. Mm. And so whatever it was that convinced him to go out and have yep. one more go... Uh, was he? Who was he trying to prove it to yeah. himself? He didn't need to prove anything. No, to there himself. was nothing to prove. Yeah, and and uh, you know to to go in the way he did, you know, you, you just look and you think, well, it's all so wrong, but it's yeah. real. That's what happens. Yeah. So, mm. I when you say about Targa, you know, limiting and that, yeah, I, there is a time when mm. they have to, you know, set some regulations. You can't simply have people continually wait. I mean, they, yeah. the, the safety gear, the, what they wear, the way the cars are built, there shouldn't be any deaths exactly. in, in the yeah. sport mm. at all. So. And that's the thing, somebody with Peter's skill, if, yeah. if they can die in an event like that, that means that an average Joe who's gone oh, and spent yes. a couple of hundred so, grand yes, on like, car like Yeah, a lot of wealthy people yeah, or exactly. hobbyists. Or... So following that, I got, I did a lot of public speaking uh, with road safety. Mm -hmm. I was on the... Um, uh, patron for the Road Trauma Association, and I'd go up to uh, with the Australian Road Safety Foundation. We'd mm -hmm. uh, I'd go up and we'd talk, do safety talks in the mines up yep. in Queensland and stuff like that. And and the thing for me, the way I would put it across is, look, here's somebody who is seen to be the best driver mm -hmm. in top competitive sport in Australia, thirteenth in the worldwide yep. best ones. And I said, and he can still lose his life. Mm -hmm. So you guys, let's look at this and see what it is you've got to change mm. to make sure that you don't put your families in the situation that yeah. we found ours in. Mm. So when you can yeah. get it down to those basic things, um, it can sometimes penetrate and make a difference. And so if out of something that's really sucks, mm. you can turn something and, and you yes. know, if in any way it can stop somebody else from yeah, making a bad itself. decision. Yeah. yeah. So mm. I look at Targa and things like that and I think, it's, well, I'm out of, I've got nothing to do with the decision yeah. making, but please be careful yeah well yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such an interesting race too because it's there's nothing that you know the, these targets there's they're really individual style races i mean the fact that you're going through small country towns they yeah. close off roads there's like a, like a hay bale sort of barrier yeah. um and you can just go at it like a like a wild person but it's, it's very different to a racetrack. At a racetrack, mm. you have so much safety. You've got runoff areas. Mm. Some of these places, you've got trees both sides of the road. Yep. The weather can change very quickly. So, you know, the car ahead could be in a different road condition to you. Someone can spill oil, yep. which you don't even know about until you exactly. get there. Yep. There's just so many variables that you don't have at a racetrack. Yep. And yeah, look, to, to me, I've, I've done a couple of those events just um, in, in touring stages, which yep. are speed limited. And even that, to me, I'm definitely not a race driver, yep. but I'm sort of, you know, white knuckled. I can't even imagine what it'd be like when there is no speed limit and you're up against a clock. Like, you are you are wanting to go fast, but it's, yeah. It's well, hard. where Peter met his end was just up the road from where I grew up with as a kid. Oh, oh you're kidding. And incredible. I was asked to go back in a number of times. No, I'm not going Yeah, no, it. thanks. God, yep. no way. I don't need to be seeing that it's just you know and on at Bathurst I was up there a couple of weeks ago um because uh, my middle son lives on Conrod Strait yep <laughs> and cool. um so I went up there because his kids came down from Queensland for holidays so I went up and spent a couple of days up there and and uh, had another visitor who's a gold medal winner in at, at the Olympics mm -hmm came up to visit me and I and took him a, on a lap around. He, mm -hmm. I said, no, you're driving. <laughs> and just, he he was absolutely, you know, when you've come across Skyline and yeah, you're heading down yeah. through the S's and just, oh, God, it scares hell out of 
most people. Yeah. And, and yet they just breeze through, you know. It's well, just... that's a thing. If you haven't been there, you don't know the elevation <laughs> changes. Yeah. And the elevation change is ridiculous. You are literally climbing a steep road and yeah. they're flying through there. Yeah. Mm. It is a remarkable track. And I think you look at uh, tracks around the world, nothing else really compares no. to it. And they're actually having discussions at the moment at Spa yeah. um, uh, with oh, Well, that's Rouge. second. I mean, Bathurst. Yeah. And then Hockenheim, uh, you know, I mean, Spa is an amazing track yeah. and out in the forest and all that. It's, it's beautiful. Um, but but they're, they're talking about the safety stuff there at the yeah. moment as well because they're, they're constantly losing people there, we, you know. We, we, the last 24 hour race we did, oh my God. <laughs> uh, that's the pits were, as you come up the hill yep. then, r basic rules were non existent. <laughs> we had. Um, in our pits had a 44 fuel, uh, gallon yep. fuel and on top of that a bit of wood and a chair and I'd sit on the chair to do the timing oh my goodness. but then the corporate hospitality was above and somebody and somebody dropped their umbrella hit me on the top of the head bounced oh off. my goodness when the car's coming in I'd have to find a way to leap down off this structure to go in and get the food <laughs> to feed them all in the moments when <laughs> they're in the pits it just Spa was, you know, you could wear whatever girlies in their bikinis yep. and wander along <laughs> into the pit area. And you just, for our guys to get to the car, they developed a technique. They had a long bit of rope. One would stand in front of the car and one at the back and it'd be laying on the ground. And when they needed them, <laughs> they'd pull the rope tight and it'd just toss all these. Oh, that is clever. Little <laughs> dollies in their bikinis and the blokes <laughs> out of the way and just. Oh, that it, is gold. It, spa was a very, very unique situation yeah very bit but again how many people in their life can find you know for somebody like me who grew up barefooted yeah horse and cart ends up meeting yeah. over yeah going to the most amazing places meeting the most amazing people doing the most amazing things mm. so when people say to me oh, i feel sorry for you, you've done it tough. no i've had the I mean, best you've life lived a, an has it been perfect yeah. no i mean who has a perfect life that's right yeah. we're all going to die eventually yep. Mm. yep that's the reality so yep. if you could see that if you could see uh i guess your life on a board would there be anything you'd change no 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 not really i mean there are a few people i'd probably choose not to get to <laughs> overly have have a presence in my life but other than that no no um just before you came in as well i was just having a bit of a laugh with gordy um uh I know that you mentioned before the the situation with, um, you know, with sponsors yeah. and, and needing to make ends meet. How do you find people who are using uh, Peter's name to to make a buck? Oh. Um, because we, we it's found the bane of our existence. I found this on car sales. So yeah. one and a half million bucks for yeah. a VX Series Two manual. I, who, that car, I don't. You don't have to give it to me any yep. closer. Do you know whose car that was? No, it's Roberts, our middle son's car. Right. Peter bought it yep. for him, yep. and so therefore Peter's name is on the uh -huh, the invoice purchase, the invoice certificate. Interesting, and, okay. And it's a it was a very ordinary car. Well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I saw it was a V six manual. I thought I don't think Peter would be seen dead in a V six manual. Exactly. <laughs> it was for Rob to get around it, and I, I, and he actually had a head on on our driveway. I don't know, with um, Catherine's boyfriend. Oh right. He was coming up, and Rob was going down, and. They okay, had, which, well, that, that was one I would put my hand up and say it wasn't me. <laughs> Thank you for um, that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, that was that was somebody else we had living in that place. Yeah. And so we ch had to change our drive from being a one way to a big loop so that that didn't happen. It was so again. busy. <laughs> but that when Rob when they got in touch with him and said that yep. somebody wanted that they wanted a million and a half yeah. for it, we just laughed. Absolutely, the number of times I have to authenticate. Yep. And go through, and and a lot of them are fair dinkum, but yep. there are some there that are. One guy wanted me to sign because often it's the the glove box yep. because I do quite a few car shows and yep. that sort yep. of stuff. That's and I get to, I sign cars. I personally think it's taking toning down the car a bit, but people still want me to sign. So it's a glove box lid. So this guy gets in touch with me, wants me to sign the glove box. Yeah, that's fine. So he lives in Diamond Creek yep. apparently, gives me the address. See you at 10 o'clock on yep. Saturday. So I go there to the address, 10 o'clock Saturday morning, knock on the door. Bloke's not there. The woman, the woman who lives in there, is so-and-so, no, never heard of them. I said, beg your pardon? And I was told to come here at 10 o'clock. said, no, that's our name. We've lived here for years. And I'm thinking, I've that's... walked out and I've got my text in my hand and this bloke comes out from behind a tree. He's oh. just picked somebody's 
place where he can hide. Because he thinks that you'll think it's okay because it's just down the road sort of yeah. thing. Unbelievable. Oh, and sign it because it, if if they've got the sign yeah. on the whether it's a glove box, whether it's in the engine, no matter what it is, yeah. It adds a bit of extra That is dollar. disgraceful. The number of people who have wanted to buy my car, oh, it was your car, and they want the extra insurance and it's going to cost this much. I think, what, for a car I drove for two weeks? <laughs> Do you know, it's funny it's you crazy. mentioned about the Peter Signature yeah. as well because <clears throat> my mates went to uh, a, a car show, whether it be uh, the Melbourne car show or whatever, and uh, <clears throat> I hadn't long been uh, <laughs> dating Alex at the time, <laughs> and my uh, my mates, my rat bag mates, went up to him and go, "We're Gordy's mates," <laughs> and he goes, "Oh, are Fuck you? Off. <laughs> yeah." <laughs> Uh, there's lucky there's people around, um, witnesses. Um, so they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he wants to get a Tirana, which is true. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's got the, he gets this poster and he goes, hang on a second. And he just goes, dear Gordy, forget Tiranas, keep with the Swift. <laughs> 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 that is brilliant. <laughs> and then I'd seen him that day and he just looked at me and pointed and I said, what? He goes, oh, you don't know, you'll, you'll find out. Okay. <laughs> then my mates with this just couldn't wait to come over and show me this poster. That is so good. Yep. Uh, so, um, yeah. In terms of cars, which is really supposedly what this is largely about, yeah. <laughs> at one point in time, and I hadn't been living down here in Melbourne all that long, Peter was running in the Alpine Rally mm -hmm. and I was to drive up. He had been up the other day or so beforehand. Well, Commodore was just about to be released. Yep. It hadn't been released, but Peter had one of the pre-release cars as a test car. Yep. And what year was this? Uh, oh, it has to be back in 70, yeah, like 70. Yep. 6, 77 yep. or something. Mm. So I've got his road car, and I'm driving up to meet <laughs> them up there on the um, uh, on the Saturday, uh, halfway through the rally. So I've headed off in this Commodore, and not taking the full impact, packed off it and I'm heading up towards Seymour and these two young guys in a car behind me have seen oh, new car <laughs> pre-release and so are coming up right on my bumper and they're looking and pulling right inside and they're looking and I'm freaking and I'm yep. you know thinking so I've put my foot down and taken off and out from behind a tree sits a policeman uh -huh. with a thing stop yep. oh, fuck. so I've pulled over <laughs> I've stopped and he booked me for doing 110 k and I said, well, what about, the, yeah. what, no, sorry, <laughs> what about the guys who yeah. were hassling me? And they didn't, he, oh, no, we hadn't seen those. Yeah, right. So apparently the helicopter up there oh, right. sees a car speeding, get calls down to the cop, steps yep. out from behind a tree, stops. So yep. I, get a, <laughs> I get a speeding fine, uh, <laughs> exceeding 100K, blah, 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 blah. And forget that, put it, uh, put it aside, go up, up there for the rally, come home. Come Monday morning, I thought, this is pre-computer days. <laughs> um, maybe it's wise that I actually go in and get my licence changed to a Victorian licence, <laughs> which I did, yeah. because that's what people do when you move into state. Yeah, yeah. So I now had a Victorian licence, and the New South Wales licence <laughs> never came out of my handbag again. So I was very naughty. <laughs> But it shows the impact. And, and these days you don't yep. see that. But back then when a new car, a new yep. model, it was big interest and everybody yep. wanted to see and know. And, mm. Well, and I mean, Australian manufacturing is yeah, non -existent. It's dead now. Yep. Um, we film a lot of our content at Lang Lang, the old, yeah, old improving I, ground. I drove around there. there you go. I mean, the race car. <laughs> you got some yeah. history there. Yeah. That place has been around for ages. Yeah. Um, it's sad to me uh, personally that that's going to disappear someday. Yeah. It's already on the market today. Yeah. Housing, it'll be yeah, housing it'll be development. Kind of block of yep. units or something. Um, I, I just feel like, uh, you know, Holden, while it was Australian, it sort of worked well, but there was always that American overlord. Yeah. And then now that they've they've killed it, yeah. they've taken all the history with them. No one knows where any of these documents are. Yeah. Like, it's all just gone. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like... It's just such a big loss it and such a shame. that too. I think that when I, when I watch Bathurst too. Yep. It's... um. Yeah, it's sad. It is sad. Yeah. Mm. The day Ford announced publicly that yep. they were stopping manufacturing, I'm looking after 
Peter's uncle, yep. Sandy, because the, his farm was next door to ours. And we see, I am look out the back window and see this fire down mm. the paddock. I think, what's that? So we've hopped in the car and driven down the side road. And there's a Ford, a late model Ford, in the gate on fire. The gate, the posts are burnt down, yeah. the car's burnt, One a, a brand new Ford. And they, they've chosen a Brock gateway to set fire to their <laughs> Ford because they're no longer manufacturing. Unbelievable. So I've got this photo well, of this. Some, some weird protest? Yeah. <laughs> well, why else would it happen? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, How yeah. odd. It was the is. weirdest thing, but there you go. <laughs> that is so interesting. Uh, before we wrap, do you have a uh, do you have a favourite car of Peter's? Do I have one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do you? Do I, is it, in, do, in yeah, my mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not in not in ownership. No, yeah. Not in possession. I wish. Do you have a? Yeah. <laughs> Can you but, sign it for us? Yeah, if you could sign the boot, and, uh, my mate's going to come out of the bush in Diamond Creek and pick it up. Um, but uh, yeah, do you, like the, the, there are some, yeah, some amazing developed. cars. Yeah. Are, are even even. Um, even the, there was a there was a beautiful two door Monaro which he had when that Monaro that first one, yeah, got yeah. Uh, yeah. re released. Yeah. You know, it had big Monaro written yeah, up on the yeah. side. I think it was a four two seven. I yeah. can't tell, but um, there was some amazing beautiful stuff. Car. The, the, the Monaro that he got it was a particular paint job. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. I loved that car. But um, he because he changed, he built so many cars. I'd get them for a brief time, but. Um, at one stage, there was a. Um, I had a beautiful blue uh, Statesman mm. that I really enjoyed driving. And a couple of years ago, somebody had rung up and knew that that was my car and they were <laughs> going to pay this amount of money and it was going to cost them this much to insure it. And I went, Seriously? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. Whatever the story goes. Um, there was that one, but there, a lot of uh, his development cars he would actually keep. Oh, really? Because for long, well, yep. when I say keep, maybe it lasts a couple of months. Yep, yep, yep. But he would do the development and, he, and he'd go into work and on the way and he'd be thinking all the things. Okay, guys, what we did yesterday, need to remove it. Now we're going to do this, this, and guys. <laughs> <laughs> and Homer had come and that would go on. And, and so of a night time, he'd say, Bevo, come on, we're a test run. So he'd do it in the dark and out, because out near the farm, out in the hills, there was yep. you know, all big properties, no traffic, yep. dirt roads and that sort of stuff. And if you did it on night, it was safer because you could see headlights, yep. the glow from yep. headlights, so you could do a test run. Yep. <laughs> so I, it, it, it was always the, the test runs, make sure that you know it's all going right and so forth. So this constant changeover of cars was enormous. But then when he was not with Holden and, and went with Volvo, mm. I, I got new Volvo cars on the road. <laughs> and then I had BMW. Yep. They'd changed the BMW. I'd get a new little BMW yep. every month, and that was pretty good. <laughs> um, so despite the fact that I good cars were wasted on me and his idea, I actually had a lot of cars over a short period of time. And so that it surprises me when people seem to think that because I sat my butt in a car and drove it yep. for a couple of months that somehow it's worth more money. I'd understand yep. if it was him. Yep. But even anything then, the Brock just, name is just yep. they. It's just opportunistic. Yeah, yep. and I deal with a um, guy in South Australia who's a policeman mm -hmm. who got in touch with me because the car he was buying and he, and he wasn't one hundred percent sure about its veracity. Yep. And when I looked into it, no, mate, this is not a genuine <laughs> article. The the build number has been stolen off a plate from a car that was crashed. So yep. he's taken it upon himself to. To you know, look after people to find out more. That about is awesome. Right? Yeah. I love that because yeah. people get scammed so oh, often with yeah. authenticity stuff. Yeah. You know, and for someone who generally wants it as a collectible item, yeah. they're willing to pay big money for it. Um, I'm not happy to see somebody lose yep. money when on good money when they're yep. decent people. Like. Yep. So, and and I feel sorry sometimes for the people who want their car authenticated mm. because. They bought it believing yes. it was, and they now think they're going to get a million dollars for their car. And mate, mm. it's like anything else; it's it's going to be worth eighty, ninety thousand, maybe dollars. Yep. So, mm. well, there are, there are crooks in every, no yep. matter what industry you're yep. in. There's 100%. always going to be somebody. So, mm. and when Peter's cars, his road cars, all that are around, sell for over a million dollars, his race cars, yep, two mm. over yep. two million dollars. You look and think. Yeah, when people think that we mm. we sort of own the car. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. It's Not, it's yeah. when it's a few steps yeah. down that people are transacting. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Well, thanks for stopping by. Not <laughs> Just a quick <laughs> chat.
<laughs> no, not a really, problem. It's been really, really pleasant. appreciated. Um, pleasant. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, I guess one thing I, I, I wanted to kind of bring to the table was uh, that everyone uh, looks at, at Peter as, you know, Peter Perfect and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, I think, as we sort of briefly mentioned, that you are, you're 50% of that. You're the reason. Um, I didn't have any, abili uh, any ability. I was just home based. <laughs> yeah. You could, if you could create a calm at home, you were doing well. That was good. <laughs> well, it, it was always such a warm, lovely, uh, family unit. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I just hope you realize that, Thank you know, you. it's hard. I do. I look at, uh, if I look back at it now, it was an amazing period of time mm. in history. It was an amazing period of time to have lived. I was very fortunate and you know, you, you're not going to have that sort of stuff come around very often in the world, so mm. I, I know how fortunate I was. And, you know, the thing is that Peter and I were a really good team until in the end where he started doubting himself about everything. Mm. And that, to me, when I see young people doubt their own abilities and I know, you know, what has the potential to happen, there's not for a minute that Peter did that deliberately or any, in mm. any way, shape or form, but... But a lot of people who, when they get down and depressed like that, and we, we find it with our football, yep. you know, our, our, our ex-coaches and captains and that sort of stuff, that mental attitude, and as Peter said, you know, it's not about the engineering of the car. It's not about your skill. It's about your where your brain is at when you get behind the wheel of the car. Mm. So the instant you sit in that car, know that you're driving a lethal, potential mm. lethal weapon, get your head in the right mm. place. And that counts for far more mm. than anything else. And and he's right. He was right. And it's, you know, to me, that's the sad thing that a lot of that's got mm. lost in history. But that's life. Can't change it. 